Bayesian statistics uh, has really gained uh, influence in the last 10 or 20 years, and a large part of that is because that prior to that, many of the computations that were needed to do Bayesian statistics were very hard or even impossible to do. And I'm going to mention uh, some aspects of that in, in this part of the talk on a method called Markov Chain Monte Carlo or MCMC. So you'll recall from a previous slide that we compute the posterior probability that some set of parameters wi are true given the data using this equation. In this particular example, I was assuming that we were looking at different discrete possible values of the parameters w uh, and, uh, and, and, and that we could therefore in the numerator have this sum which according to the law of total probability gave us the total probability of d, the total probability of the data. However, quite often the models we are looking at do not have discrete parameter values but have continuous parameter values. For instance, branch lengths in a tree, uh, we will have any possible length uh, of, of branches in the tree. So it's a continuous parameter. Same goes for nucleotide frequencies and nucleotide substitution rates, for instance. In the case of continuous parameters, instead of a, a sum in the, in the um, uh, denominator here, we will instead have an integral. I've just shown an example of that here and we will have uh, multiple integrals when we have multiple different uh, parameters. As it turns out, this expression can sometimes, or actually most of the time, be extremely difficult to compute and often be impossible to compute analytically. It might even be very, very hard to compute numerically using standard uh, numerical techniques. And this was actually one of the main problems with doing Bayesian statistics apart from some philosophical uh, discussions that were also going on. Uh, but the main fact, the simple fact that it was very hard to do this computation of, of this part of the equation meant that that uh, Bayesian analysis was hard to do. The solution to this problem uh, came along uh, not so long ago, uh, in the 80s mostly, and was uh, called Markov Chain Monte Carlo or MCMC. The idea in MCMC is that you want to compute this complicated integral in a way uh, that, that where you don't have to actually analytically solve the problem. The way it's done is the following. I'm going to try to walk you through how, how this works. So the starting point for doing Marco Chin Monte Carlo approximation of, of this uh, value in the, in the numerator, sorry, in the denominator, I always get those wrong, the way of using Marco Chain Monte Carlo to compute that expression is the following. The starting point is a parameter space. So you have a number of parameters in your model. Each possible parameter has a range of possible values. The parameter space is the space that covers all possible combinations of all values for all your parameters. Now for each possible value, for each possible parameter value in that space, you can compute the likelihood. Okay, so if it's a, a simple coin tossing example, then for any possible value of p, you can compute the, the probability of the data that you've seen. If it's a phylogenetic sample, then for any possible value of nucleotide frequencies and branch lengths, etc., etc., you can compute the probability of your alignment in the manner that you yourself have done in a previous exercise. Bottom line is, for any given possible parameter value in this space, it's possible to compute the likelihood. Okay, so we have that. Secondly, for any possible space, uh, sorry, for any possible uh, point in the space, for any possible set of parameter values, we also know the prior probability. This is, uh, by definition, this is something that you need to have defined when you start a Bayesian analysis. You need a prior probability of any possible set of parameter values. In the simplest Example, you might put an equal probability on all possible values of your parameter. So, and what we call a flat prior. But typically you actually know something about your parameters even before starting and you will then with advantage have a non-flat prior. Bottom line is, going into a Bayesian analysis, you will always have a prior probability distribution. So for any possible place, for any possible point in parameter space, you can compute the likelihood of that point and you know the prior probability for that point. This means that you can compute prior times likelihood for any given point in the parameter space. 
Now, prior times likelihood is actually the, uh, the numerator of Bayes' theorem. The numerator of Bayes' theorem is the likelihood times the prior. So for any given point in parameter space, you can compute the value that is on the top of, of, that, uh, of that equation in Bayes' theorem. Okay, we can use this as a way of uh, empirically approximating the uh, posterior distribution without actually computing the denominator. How do we do that? We do it according to the recipe that I'll walk you through here, and uh, which is known as Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or more specifically here, the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. So, our starting point is a parameter space. As I say, for any given point in parameter space, you can compute the prior, uh, you know the prior, and you can compute the likelihood. So let's say we start in some random position in this parameter space on this probability landscape. For this particular position, let's call the starting position x, we now compute prior times likelihood. Let's call that px. So we are starting at some point that has some height in the probability landscape where prior times likelihood has some height and we call this px. Now, based on where we are standing right now, we now take attempt to take a move in the parameter space. We do that using something called a proposal distribution. A proposal distribution is some probability distribution from which we draw randomly a step that we will attempt to take. So the proposal distribution, Q of Y given X, given the current position X, we try to take a move to a new position Y, will typically be something like, for instance, a normal distribution with some standard deviation centered on the current value. So if we're standing at a parameter value that has, say, 0.5 right now, then we might suggest a move to 0.67 or 0.35 or whatever. At this new position, y, we can again compute the prior times the likelihood. There are now two possibilities. If the new position, if prior times likelihood at this new position y is higher than prior times likelihood at our previous position x, then we say we accept the move. I'll return to uh, what that means. If, on the other hand, prior times likelihood for the new position is less than prior times likelihood for the old position, then we do not necessarily accept the move, but we accept it with a probability described by the equation that I have in the first of the two boxes. The probability of accepting a move that ends slightly lower or that ends lower than we started can be found by taking probability in the new position times the probability of getting to x from y divided by the probability in the old position times the probability of getting to y from x. Now, if the proposal distribution is symmetric, if q of x given y is the same as q of y given x, then these terms cancel out, and that will be true, for instance, for a normal distribution centered on x. If the proposal distribution is symmetric like a normal distribution, then the acceptance probability is simply the probability, the prior times the likelihood in the new position, divided by the prior times the likelihood in the old position. So if, for instance, the prior times the likelihood in the new position is 95% of the value it had in the old position, then you have a 95% chance of accepting that move. If you end much, much lower, if prior times likelihood is now 1 in 10,000 of the old value, then you have a very small probability of accepting your move. So the closer you, you are to your old value, the more likely you are to accept the move. In either case, if you end higher up and accept it by, uh, by default, or if you end lower down and then accept it by randomly drawing from this uh, distribution, then you write the value, the, the set of parameter values for the new position in what we call a sample file. If you do not accept the move, then you write the values of the old position once more in your sample file. It turns out that if you repeat this process iteratively, step after step after step, proposing a move in parameter space, accepting it or not according to these rules, writing the corresponding parameter values in a file, attempting a new move, accepting it or not, 
writing the corresponding parameter values in a file. If you keep doing this over and over and over again for many, many steps, then after a while, the points that you will, you will tend to, because of these rules, you will tend to walk up hill most of the time. You can also walk downhill, but you will definitely get more points from the higher parts of the probability landscape. And as it turns out, you will actually get proportionally more points from the higher uh, parts of the landscape in such a manner that if you were to make a histogram of the parameter values you got out of this after sufficiently running it for sufficiently long, if you were to make a histogram, that histogram would in fact look exactly like the actual probability distribution. So this is a way of, as we say, sampling from that distribution. It's a way of empirically getting points that will describe the shape of that distribution. And if you make a histogram of that, you actually have the probability distribution. And since the distribution we're trying to describe here is the posterior probability distribution, this is a way of empirically approximating the posterior distribution without ever actually computing the, um, the denominator. This is a very uh, clever trick, uh, and it has really uh, made a difference in allowing Bayesian computation to be possible. There are some problems though, and that is that if we have a probability landscape where we have more than one peak, then you can see that because of these rules, it's more likely to walk uphill than downhill, and you will rarely move down into the foothills there. Then it can be difficult for this process to find the second peak. Okay, there's a small probability of getting down, crossing the valley floor, and getting up on the next peak. One solution to that is what we call Metropolis coupled Markov chain Monte Carlo or MC, MC, MC or MC uh, to the third. The main idea in that is that instead of running just one Markov chain, each of these processes where you walk randomly around proposing moves is called a Markov chain. If you run several Markov chains simultaneously, you call one of the chains cold, that's the one where you sample from, the one where you write the parameter values. The rest of the chains are heated, they move faster, they can take larger steps across valleys, for instance, and each turn you give the cold and the warm chain an opportunity to swap depending on their relative heights, prior times likelihood, then you can actually end up visiting many more peaks and you will typically find all, all peaks or more peaks at least in your probability landscape. So, this is an advantage. It's used in the software you'll use for one of the exercises. Mr. Base, you can run any number of chains uh, in parallel or at the same time. But of course, it, it costs. Every time you run an extra chain, you double or you, you add an extra uh, a chain that takes more computational power. So if you have a computer with many processors, you can parallelize it. But otherwise, if you run 10 chains, it's going to take 10 times as long as if you run one chain. So there's a trade-off. Now, in the case of phylogeny, what do we get out of a Bayesian analysis? Well, as I say, we have a model which has some parameters. In the case of phylogeny, as we know by now, that model is a model of how one sequence has evolved into a set of present-day sequences. The parameters include the tree shape, the branch lengths, the nucleotide frequencies, the nucleotide-nucleotide substitution rates, and maybe other things such as gamma, uh, uh, gamma distribution parameters and, 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 and other things potentially. The bottom line is we have a number of parameters in our model. We start with some random set of parameter values, random tree, random branch lengths, random nucleotide frequencies, random substitution rates, and then starting at that point we compute prior times likelihood. You can do that, you know how to compute the likelihood. Then we propose a step, we change the parameters slightly, we change the nucleotide frequencies, we change the branch lengths, etc., etc., and then at that new point in parameter space, we again compute prior times likelihood and accept or do not accept the move. After having done that for sufficiently long, we will end up with a sample file where for each parameter we now have different sampled values, accepted values after moving around parameter space like this. So in this case, I've just shown you an example from a parameter file that Mr. Base, the software we will use for this, has produced. You'll see that we have, for instance, the substitution parameter, the rate parameter between C and T. It starts out at 0.166, then it starts moving around in parameter space, 0 0.19, 0 0.22, 0 0.27, 0 0.32, 0 0.17, etc., etc. Same for the G to T substitution rate. It samples, moves around parameter space, samples different values, 
Same for the nucleotide frequencies, just the frequency of A starts randomly at 25%, then 22, 25, 26, 26, 25, etc. For each possible parameter, we get a huge sample file with many different samples uh, that we can then end up making a histogram of, as I'll show you. We also get, for each step in parameter space, we also try out different trees. These trees are rearranged using the rearrangement methods we've already discussed, NNI, SPR, TPR, for instance. All of these different rearrangements are taken as proposed moves in the tree space and either accepted or not. So in the same way that you get different possible values in your sampling file for parameters, you also get different possible trees. As for the parameters, we can then in the end show the corresponding empirical probability distributions over the parameter values. Here's an example for substitution rates, different substitution rates between four nucleotides. Uh, one on an analysis that I did on some, some data set I, I have. And you can see that in this case, for instance, the rate between A and C, there's some probability distribution over the possible values. It's centered around 0.1 and it goes up to a bit less than 0.2. On the other hand, the probability, the, the rate of A to G, shown in blue here, seems to be much higher. There's some uncertainty. It's centered around 0.25, but it extends from 0.15 to 0.4. But you can easily see that the rate between A and G, even though we are uncertain about the exact value, it seems to be larger than the rate from A to C. This corresponds to the fact that A G is a um, a transition and AC is a transversion. These are known to, to occur much more frequently. So, but the bottom line here is, using Marco Chen Monte Carlo by sampling from this parameter space, we end up with an empirical approximation of the posterior probability distribution here. So this tells us, after looking at our data set, what do we believe about these uh, parameters, about these substitution rates in this case. The same is true for trees. Uh, here's one example, a data set with just five species, human, chimp, gorilla, orangutan, and, and gibbon. Uh, for five species, there are 15 possible trees. That means that in this case, we exhaustively get to look at every possible tree in tree space. For each of them, we, at each step in this Marco Chain Monte Carlo process, we attempt a move, we rearrange the tree slightly, we try out new trees. Uh, and in the end, we will have a huge file where we will have on each line a particular tree topology written. At the end of such a run, we can count how often did we see each of the 15 possible trees. And in this particular case, for instance, there's overwhelming support for the tree we know to be true, namely the one where we have human and chimp together, followed by gorilla, followed by orangutan, followed by, by gibbon. This has, in this case, about 92% uh, posterior probability. The, Second most likely tree is this one where we have human and gorilla together instead of human and chimp together. So, and the rest of the trees are much less likely. So this will give us what we call the maximum posterior or map estimate of tree topology. That's this particular single uh, value. Uh, it will also give us clade support, the probability of having some particular group in your, in your data. That can be found, for instance, the human and chimp group are found in this tree, which has 92%, this tree, which has 9%, and there should be one more, I think, um, and this one, which has 4%. So by adding up, uh, sorry, 0.4%. So by adding up these three numbers, we get the overall support for the human and chimp clade. We could do the same for other possible groupings. You can see that human and chimp together uh, for sure has much more support than human and gorilla together. Finally, we can, based on such data, make what we call a 95% set, a credible set of trees. We could sort these according to posterior probability, and then we could include all the trees such that from highest to lowest, such that the accumulated probability is 95% or more. And this will give us sort of a, a confidence interval for, for trees. So all in all, this way of doing analysis, the result is a posterior probability distribution quantifying how much we believe in different possible parameter values in different possible trees.